Hello and welcome to The Creative Experience. My name is Derek Hunt and I'm a professional glass artist. And I interview fellow artists to showcase their work, to bring you the very best in what's happening now with glass across the globe. I interview artists from a wide variety of backgrounds. Some of them are at the beginning of their careers. They've just been working with glass for maybe five or six years. Others have got an international reputation and an award-winning portfolio of glass in a variety of formats. All of them have one thing in common. They're producing beautiful, innovative and exciting new glass. And I'm here to elevate that and showcase it to you as a way of inspiring the next generation and developing a community of fellow creatives. If you find value in this, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel because I create videos on a very regular basis. And so today it is my great pleasure to introduce and bring to your attention Judith Schachter. I first was introduced to Judith's work through this particular piece called King of Maggots. I was blown away by it. Hieronymus Bosch meets underground comic books. It was absolutely brilliant. And as I looked into more of her work, I discovered this tremendous body of work. Judith is a master craftsman and a technical innovator, and she's spent decades creating these stunning, evocative works in stained glass. Her influence comes from a wide range of visual cultures, Picasso to Mad Magazine, decorative Islamic patterns to 19th century romantic painters, underground comics, and the East Village art scene in the early 1980s. What I particularly love about Judith's work is it doesn't come from the traditions of stained glass. It doesn't come from that orthodox ecclesiastical visual language. It's entirely separate to that and so refreshing and engaging as a result. I wanted to showcase her work before the interview to give you a flavour of what she does. Just spend a few moments with me enjoying and indulging yourself in this visual feast. And I hope you enjoy the interview. I certainly enjoyed it. I could have spent so much more time with Judith. She's a wonderful communicator, great to spend time with, really engaging. Her work is represented in over a dozen museums, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Museum of Art and Design, Philadelphia Museum of Art, and Toledo Museum of Art, and in major exhibitions around the world. If you enjoyed this interview, leave a like uh, and leave suggestions for future artists whom you'd like me to interview. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hi Judith, how are you? I'm good Derek, how are you? Fabulous, fabulous, great to see you. Where are you speaking from today? I'm in my studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And is this where you create all your wonderful stuff? Is this where you're all, all the magic happens? <laughs> yeah, magic. Um, yes, this is it. This is, uh, I, I, it's more like a, uh, a battlefield than a sanctuary but this is where where i worked i love old things and you can't get a medieval house in the united states uh obviously so um uh the oldest houses in philadelphia are probably from the 1600s but they have terribly low ceilings yeah yeah uh, everybody was a lot smaller <laughs> bad nutrition <laughs> So yeah, you're fresh back from a retrospective. How how was that? Was that a was that a a long time in the making? And how did you feel about that whole event? Well, first of all, I the retrospective took many years to plan, and I was so excited and enthusiastic 
that I felt it would be bad luck to talk about it. And I never mentioned it to anybody. And then it opened in February of 2020. And then it closed in March of 2020 because of COVID. It was devastating and wonderful. And I also felt somewhat guilty, like how can I be complaining about my retrospective closing when people are dying and losing their jobs and really horrible things were happening? Um, so uh, I'm, the exhibition did reopen and it did travel from the Rochester, Rochester Memorial Art Gallery in New York State, upstate New York, kind of near Niagara Falls. Um, it traveled from there to Toledo. I went to Toledo in an airplane um, during, before there were vaccines. <laughs> I guess I'm willing to die for my art after all. <laughs> <laughs> and that was fine. I didn't get sick. And then the exhibition traveled to Des Moines, Iowa. I did not go to Des Moines. Um, and the exhibition was open in both spots. And I understand that it got good attendance. Uh, one of the strange things about being the subject of, of an art exhibit in general is that you're not there to see the people seeing the work. So it's hard to say what's going on on a certainly on a day to day basis. I have no idea. I went to Rochester, they had an opening. And that was one of the strangest, almost out of body dissociative experiences of my life. I had a lot of um, worries about it not first of all i was outstandingly grateful and thrilled that this was happening uh, early in the planning process i understood that i had to butt out because it was really tempting to say this piece has to go in that piece can't go in and i'm not the curator so i decided if i can't be the curator i'm going to not be involved at all unless they ask because it was really none of my business. And so it, it got to the point where I was like, I don't know what I think of this show. And I, I got there and I saw the show before it opened. And I, was, I didn't know who made the work. I was like, this is, this, this is amazing. Whoever did this is really prolific. <laughs> and That's brilliant. But, I, some of the pieces I haven't seen in 25 years. So it, a lot of work, most of the work was borrowed and back from collectors and museums. And it was thrilling to see it. Thrilling. It was, I mean, it was an out of body experience, but of course I'm not neurologically damaged to the point where I don't recognize my own work. So I knew it was mine, <laughs> but it, it, it felt pretty, pretty strange. And it, and wonderful it was it was great and then it closed and it was horrible <laughs> it's a really interesting thing isn't it when you see your work after a long period of time it's this wonderful kind of newness but then seeing an old friend the familiarity and you kind of scan it and you think of all of the areas in it that you had problems with and things that you worried about you think well that, that actually doesn't look so bad now and I, I i worried lots about this bit or that bit and it's a really strange thing but it's lovely to come back to your work and see it almost with fresh eyes isn't it i got jealous of myself i used to be very free before i understood all of the consequences of of my um of technique stained glass wise like now i know what happens when you don't fire it correctly in the kiln <laughs> idea i mean I, and i didn't care so much so i it some of that work seems very free to me and uh a real sense of you can't go home again because much as i would like to be that free now um that's impossible i am who i am now i'm not that person anymore and uh it was it was interesting to see it it, it is the work of another person in that sense and uh so yeah, so I was simultaneously jealous and I was also like, in some ways I haven't changed. I'm a real case of arrested development, in, especially in terms of my ideas. I'm still doing sort of screaming women and highly decorative imagery. And, uh, and I'm just doing it differently. It's the same thing, but different. 
and in well your work your work is your work is maturing and your your technique is maturing i mean that's yeah, you know exactly. as you say you're kind of learning you're learning about the kind of the the nature of the material but your your work is so strikingly different i mean i think what one of the key things for me that i absolutely love about your work is that it's absolutely clear that you don't come from the orthodox root you're not looking at glass from that orthodox training you are coming at it with a fresh eye which is absolutely wonderful and i celebrate that and i celebrate the freedom of that and the fact that you're i think you were set you were telling me earlier when you sent me some images through that klaus nomi was one of your uh, influences uh, i mean that 90s sort of 80s 1980s uh, uh, opera diva artist was fantastic and this sort of idea of bringing in this fantasy costume idea uh, i mean you're you're bringing in talk about a little bit about the influences that you have because you're sourcing completely secular images they're nothing to do with the orthodox religious stained glass that most people know and that actually is one of the great strengths of your work so talk a little bit about your influences and what really brought you into glass as a medium to start with well, that makes me think of three things very specifically. And well, first of all, I am talking about a piece that was very directly influenced by Klaus Nomi. But when I, I studied stained glass in art school, and um, I, w I was raised uh, in Newton, Massachusetts by uh, a mixed marriage couple. My mother was formerly a Episcopalian Christian from Oklahoma, and my father was formerly Jewish and formerly from Ecuador, South America, where he went during World War II as a child. And my parents were radical atheists. They, um, they raised me to be a radical atheist. I'm not a Richard Dawkins atheist, however. I do not begrudge anyone their spiritual nature, not even my own. Um, <clears throat> So I don't know if I saw the interior of a church until I was quite old. I certainly saw the interior of a synagogue because there was this sort of pseudo attempt to introduce me to Judaism, which didn't work at all. Um, and um, sometimes synagogues have stained glass. There's an amazing synagogue in Philadelphia. It's one of the seven wonders of the stained glass world. I went to art school with the intention of becoming an oil painter. And my, much to my mother's chagrin, she wanted me to be a children's book illustrator. She desperately wanted that. <laughs> and I took a stained glass elective that was taught by a woman named Ursula Hoot. And Ursula was a student of Hans Gottfried von Stockhausen, the post-World War II um, master from Stuttgart who uh, claims to be the inventor of the autonomous panel. And to this day, Derek, it is almost impossible not to call it an autonomous panel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> an autonomous panel. An autonomous Marvelous. panel. And so I learned how to make these autonomous panels from Ursula Huth. I took her course and then I was a TA for the course. And I knew immediately that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. I, my painting teacher did not understand why I was so sure. And all I can say is what I'm a teacher now, if a student tells me something like that, I think you're 19 years old, what do you know? But uh, I knew it and I was right. The other thing I wanted to say was about Klaus Nomi. And that is that, um, I went to school between the years of 1979 and 1983. And there, this I think is sort of forgotten in the history of popular culture and music, but there was a subgenre of punk called New Romantic. And the New Romantics were like Adam and the Ants, Klaus Nomi, Wow, Wow, Wow. And it was, all about, it was all about historical dress and acting like a complete weirdo. Um, and I was, I went to Rhode Island School of Design and this was popular there. And so um, that's how I learned about that. And that was, I think what, what we learn in our, right as we're starting to become an adult is really extra influential. And that was, that was a wonderful time. And in terms of, 
music and popular culture. How have you then developed from that point? Because you didn't go down the, the as I say, that orthodoxy route where you're kind of going, working for commissions and you're doing the, 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 the kind of work that most people who work in glass work in. You, ha you decided to go down the gallery route. You were making these autonomous panels and, and going for sort of a completely different kind of market. How did that develop? Talk us through that that sort of thinking process and how it's how it's developed over the years. I really think that was just really simple, the indoctrination of art school. First of all, art schools in the United States do not have any, any um, uh, understanding or knowledge of the history of stained glass. Even, I mean, my one course with Ursula, we talked about post-World War II glass in Germany, as I recall, <laughs> that's about it. Uh, I've since educated myself as to the history of glass, and I've gone to conferences by the Stained Glass Association of America and the American Glass Guild. Um, I am actually a member of the BSMGP, uh, a fellow. So I have educated myself now, but when I went to art school, they were really, um, if they had any sort of sense of professional career, it was to tell you that the way it worked was to get an art gallery to exhibit your work. Now that is really influenced how I um, started presenting the work. I know a lot of people look at my light boxes and they don't usually say it to my face, but I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, oh God, light boxes! Ah! I know. It's uh, very thinly disguised. Um, and that began because I needed, I didn't want my uh, autonomous panels competing with whatever was at the one plate glass storefront window. <laughs> you know, it'd be like this tiny little thing. Um, and it was always, I always imagined that people would remove them from the boxes and hang them in their windows. But first of all, the boxes are really expensive. And generally speaking, people are afraid to touch the stained glass once they own it. So as far as I know, very few people have removed them. But that was my, my early education geared me to be a gallery artist. And that is what I became. Well, I, I watched them um, when I was in lockdown earlier this year. Um, I, I started watching your videos on your process. And it was like a light bulb moment for me because I thought... <laughs> Judith, this is the way forward. This is this is how this is how we do it, and you were doing these fantastic kind of ad hoc tutorials where you were just having fun talking, talking to the audience and talking about your work, and I just was so inspired by that. And it was it was kind of it was kind of that moment where I realised that this 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 idea of taking things online and actually talking to the audience, we can do this now. It's the technology allows us to do it. It allows you and I to have a conversation together as if we're in the same room, which is which is absolutely fabulous. And do you find that when you're doing your teaching, do you do you do you get a lot back from the students? I, I certainly find when I do teaching is when you sort of give them and then you receive back their kind of response to it. It's really, it's really wonderful to see how people interpret the, the use of the medium. Well, I prefer to teach in person and I made those videos kicking and screaming. I had um, the department where I taught for years basically closed down and I was then lucky enough to be hired by Tyler School of Art, which has a very nice glass program. And I said I would only teach in person, and <clears throat> ultimately, I, um, I I wanted to teach remotely because no one was vaccinated yet. So I taught half in person, and that's where those videos came from. I agree, there's a great need to share this knowledge. Um, there's always calls among stained glass organizations about how the medium is dying and I, I i'm always torn i think like dying i think it's completely dead dead and there's not even any flesh left on the bones <laughs> it's, it's it doesn't smell anymore it's uh it died a long time ago uh, and that is freeing and wonderful in a lot of ways i think that means that we can do anything we want um one one thing I felt about the, I guess one would call it the sort of apprentice education that one gets at a studio, is that there are a lot of rules. And uh, I, and then there are also people who 
make statements like, well, it's okay to break the rules as long as you know them first. And I think like, I don't know. I think it's kind of okay not to know them first. You know the rules, you might be scared. And uh, Exactly. So It's inhibiting. As soon yeah. as you start putting up boundaries, you're starting to inhibit people. Um, I, yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, I think it's just that there are no rules in creativity and you just get, you be disrespectful. You pull it by the, the scruff of its neck and you, you pull it into a different position and a different location and you do something new with it. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you. And I think the, the tradition of stained glass has been hamstrung for that very reason, because there's so much tradition, there's so much, so much orthodoxy and, um, it's just kept on the tram lines and it's just gone in one direction on these tram lines for, for centuries. And I think it's, it can be so much more. And you're, you're kind of playing with it in a really lovely and exciting way. I, in your last question, you asked me about my students and I didn't say anything about how inspiring I find the students. And I, I don't want to forget saying that. First of all, because they are, they usually don't know the consequences of their actions. They are free to be very, much more experimental. I often get ideas from them. And one thing that happens is they tend to reject stuff that doesn't look almost professional, which I, I'm i sorry that they feel that way because a lot of that stuff is really fresh and exciting and, and um, really worth pursuing. So if they don't want it, I do. And uh, I, uh, I also love talking to them because they're, they're um, exciting and excited about art. <clears throat> I love modern technology. I think people think of stained glass artists as, you know, maybe, uh, maybe wearing historical costumes and, and working in period rooms <laughs> in some reconstructed village. Um, I, I like modern technology. It doesn't seem incompatible. I like all technology. Yeah, I mean, I, I think anything, anything that kind of facilitates getting a, getting an idea to into reality is brilliant, isn't it? The quick that's the problem I have with stained glasses. It's so bloody slow. You've got an idea, and it's weeks and weeks and weeks until you've realized that as a finished piece. And you've maybe gone, maybe the idea's gone cold, or you've you've moved on with another idea. The fact that you can produce things really quickly using modern technology and you can you can use Photoshop in layers and you can change the saturations and the transparencies just allows you to kind of it, it, it moves a little bit more at the speed that you're thinking, which I think is is really helpful for exploring ideas. I will tell you, I think one of my initial reasons for loving stained glass was the slowness, though. When I was an oil painter, I used to just uh, finger paint with, and, and make a mess. And then I would gesso over it and I, I throw it out. I, I couldn't ever form an attachment to it with the glass. It took so long to get it to do anything. I, I kind of love that. And now I think in sort of glacial epics, you know, <laughs> how long is this window going to take? I used to think every single idea was the very, very, very last one I would ever have. So I better milk it for all it's worth. And a lot of the reason my work is highly detailed is I like to be in the middle of a piece. I don't like the beginning of a piece and the end of a piece just means you're gonna be at the beginning soon. <laughs> um, so I want them to last a long time. And that's one of the reasons uh, a really intricate technique is for me. And as I've gotten older, I've unplugged more. So. A lot of things, uh, I do things with a sandblaster, but I'd rather do it with, with a hand tool that's not even plugged in. It's just more satisfying to me. What I actually think that the potential for seeing a hundred variations on my design can actually be very troublesome because there's a, a, a sort of a factor where like maybe 90 of them are kind of all the same. And I'm like, oh, which one do I pick? And it's like, you know what? I don't need that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I mean, you, you're kind of relying on, on luck and happenstance and just kind of being stimulated by what you're seeing. But then it's also not relying on it. It's not relying on the technology to kind of solve the problems for you, but just to kind of give you possibilities. I think what I like about it is the speed, is the fact that you can, you can, you can 
try out lots of ideas really quickly and then yeah. you get down to the making and as you say it's a kind of a meditation when you're making something you you kind of settle in mentally to the fact that this is going to be several weeks worth of work before you're going to get to the to the to the end game um so listen let, let, let's talk a little bit about i wanted to before we talk about your three favorite pieces because this is what i love to talk about with artists who, whose work i love but before we get to that point i just want to ask you about this main protagonist that appears in your work this this sort of solitary female um she's quite often in sort of in repose and then there's this wonderfully decorative world around her which is sometimes coral like and flower like and there are there are kind of lots of interesting exciting things going on tell me a little bit about this protagonist is it is it the same person is it you is it allegorical is it what, what tell me a little bit about that i don't think it's me i you yeah. know what i think it's a doll so i don't think of them as people and they're not me they are proxies there, there are ways of trying out identities and, and situations that are uh, removed from me so they're safer. And um, they're, they're not quite human, which may explain why they don't look quite human in my work. I always identify with them. I have done images of animals and of males. I just want to relate to them. And for me, the metric is if I can relate to them, probably someone else can relate to them too. One reason I like to make people naked basically is because um, they don't, when you put clothes on a person, you immediately know what time period the, the image is taking place in. And I want my images to take place in no time. So if they were wearing, you know, an Izod Lacoste t-shirt it's like screams 1980s or whatever so i just uh i like the timelessness of nudes so listen let's talk a little bit about your favorite pieces if we can i mean it's it's an absolute banquet of riches there are so many exciting pieces that we could talk about but i'm keen to hear which ones you want to highlight for us today well first of all thank you for asking and um it was so hard to pick three favorites that I basically didn't. I just picked three pieces that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, I think there's a sort of a cliche about artists that they imagine their artworks to be their children, and that is definitely true for me. So I can't pick between them. I picked three pieces that I don't always talk about and that they're important for varying reasons. I also tried to pick one from uh, a long time ago. Uh, so the first piece that I picked was the one called I Still Believe in Love. And that's from, I believe, 1989 or 1990. At the time, I, I, I think I, I deeply had a crush on a person. This was not returned, although I was friends with this person. And I was um, attempting to rehabilitate the um, cultural cliche of romance novel covers. The, the original conception of the piece was to have the figure um, centered. That's a, a problem I have, like a di design problem is I'm always putting the figure in the center of the window and uh, I feel like I can explore non-symmetrical compositions a little more every now and then. So I had made, uh, uh, very frequently I, I make the work and find out what I've done wrong. This is why this is why I could first of all I love fabricating things. I love being a craftsperson. I would not trade that for anything. But if I were one of those artists that had someone else fabricate their work, it would be a real problem because I'm making decisions as I'm fabricating and I'm changing my mind, sometimes radically. So shall we talk about project number two? Sure. Uh, the second piece I chose to share today was um, the one called The Cold Genius. And that was directly based on uh, a Klaus Nomi um, performance of an aria by um, Henry Purcell. I'm not an opera fan. I know nothing about opera. I do like classical music, but opera is not my thing. For whatever reason, I saw that performance, and I think it was just one of the very last ones that he gave before he passed away from AIDS, which was, uh, that meant a lot to me, uh, because 
uh, we may be going through a pandemic now, but I lost a lot of friends to AIDS, much more than COVID. And that was a hard time in my life. This piece came many years later. Um, listening to the aria and knowing that this is one of his last performances, he knew he was going to die as he's giving this performance. It's unbelievable. It's, as I understood it, it's a character begging to die. I didn't want to illustrate the song. When, I, when I'm moved by a piece of music, I don't want to make a picture of what's going on in the song, but I did want to make something analogous, something that relates to the song that if, if it could be understood as sound would look like the song. So the third piece I uh, um, shared is the one called Anchoress. So an anchoress apparently is a, um, a religious personage that got walled into the, into their cell and basically died in the walls, which I would never volunteer to do that. But I imagined that at the end, you are seeing pink elephants and uh, fantastical hallucinations. And that was sort of the top part represented <clears throat> of that piece. There is like sort of divisions in the art world that I think are very artificial. And there is this idea of visionary artists or outsider artists as somehow being not the same as the other artists. <laughs> I don't think that narrative figurative images are illustrations uh, and, or, and illustrations are some lesser art form or craft is some lesser art form. All of that I have no time for. And I, uh, another thing is the idea of visionary arts. I wouldn't ever claim that I am a shaman and that I sit around and have fantastic hallucinations. Everything that I have ever made or um, uh, created, I had to pull it out of my head. It didn't come out willingly. That's I started to understand the word draw to be like a, a horse drawing a cart. You know, it was like, oh, I'm trying to pull this idea out. I don't have fantastical images like in Anchoress. I had to make that happen. And I don't know if there are people who just sit down and do a screen grab of their own head through some mystical process? I question that. I, I think I, um, but I will also say that we don't facilitate that in art school. Like I've been through many phases as an artist, but I would say the things that Im are important to me are what the thing looks like. So I went through a phase where I talked a lot about beauty. I still, I still believe in love, Derek. And I think that in art, what it looks like like I'm willing to go to great lengths to prove that I love people and I want the piece to look beautiful for, for others, oh, to cheer people up. So I got told a lot when I was little to cheer up. That was what you did with children in the 60s when they weren't happy. You say, hey, come on, cheer up. And that didn't cheer me up. So I wanted to basically, I never thought this directly. This wasn't a conscious thought that I had when I was coming into maturity as an artist. It's something that I've understood that I did subconsciously is that I wanted to make art that would be like, oh yeah, I get it. You're depressed too. I've been there. And, uh, you know, here's a screaming woman. <laughs> here's a screaming woman to make you feel better. Um, with a really nice bird. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's it's making the unfamiliar familiar, and it's saying it's okay. It's okay to feel like this. You know, yeah. it's still it's still it's still beautiful. It's still valuable. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I I mean, it's well, it's just there, isn't yeah. that what traditional stained glass does? Like so. So you said at the beginning of this that my work was very untraditional. But I look at I'm not a Christian, but I look at images of Christian saints and and. Images, um, you know, by John Thornton, the artist who did York Minster's Apocalypse Window. He's real cartoony. I love John Thornton. He's a wacky guy. I would have liked to invite him to dinner and know what he was about as a person. Some of the imagery of the Christian church was not to encourage sadomasochism, but to say, like, your life sucks. Here's a picture of a saint. Their life sucked. See if you can't talk about this together and 
this is basically, you know, people can't stand for their suffering to be meaningless. And I think those images of saints are a way of contextualizing suffering so it's not meaningless. And that's what I'm trying to do. So I feel like I'm actually a very traditional stained glass artist. Plus everything I do is a pickle. Um, Judith, this has been absolutely wonderful. I've, I've loved talking with you and just getting a glimpse of, of the way you think and the way and your attitude to, towards your work. It is fabulous. Your, your work is collected around the world, quite rightly prized and celebrated. And it's just brilliant to spend a little bit of time with you today. So thank you so much for joining me. Derek, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I really admire the work you're doing with presenting stained glass to, to a new audience. I think it's so important. Thank you so much for doing it. And thank you for letting me be a part of it. And uh, if you're ever in the Philadelphia area, please come to my studio. Definitely. Thanks again, Judith.